Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our first Mountain Zoom of 2024. I'm Jeremy Williams. I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Agent in Harlan County. Uh, I have on here somewhere Shad Baker. He's the Ag and Natural Resources Agent in Letcher County. But uh, glad to have you all back uh, for another round of Mountain Zoom. We've uh, we've put a lot of these together. Uh, since 2020, uh, I think we're well over 150. Uh, I'd have to ask Shad uh, where we're, we're at in numbers, but uh, we appreciate you all joining us. And uh, tonight uh, we have a special guest to uh, discuss weather preparedness. One of the things that uh, with the Mountain Zoom series is we have done some disaster preparedness type uh, programming. And so uh, we're going to bring you uh, weather preparedness. And tonight we have Jane Marie Wicks. She is the Warning Coordination Meteorolo Meteorologist at uh, the Jackson National Weather Service office. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jane Marie. Jane Marie, thank you for coming out tonight. Yeah, thank you all for having me. Um, and I'm really excited to get to share this with you all. It's a fairly new presentation. I just want to make sure that you all can see it. Um, are you able to see my screen, Jeremy? Uh, right now, I'm just seeing your camera. Okay. I do see your screen. There you go. I see your sc okay. screen now. Go right ahead. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So like he said, my name is Jane Marie Wicks. Um, I am with the Jackson, Kentucky National Weather Service Office. I'm one of the managers here. And even though it says warning coordination meteorologist, one of my primary um, kind of roles as, as this position is I'm one of the liaisons for the office with, um, for example, for example, the extension offices, emergency management, media, schools, healthcare, and so on. Um, so I'm really excited to get to share this with you all tonight, and hopefully you can walk away a little bit more prepared for our hazards. So the best way that we can go forward um, in trying to work with what hazards might happen is to go back to the past. What has happened in the past? Um, could it happen again? How do we better prepare for it? So. We're going to look back a little bit at first here. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is the 2021 river flooding. I have a few pictures up here. 2021, this started in late April, sorry, late February with two ice and snow events. Um, and then we had a really heavy rain event at the very beginning of March on top of all that. And all that water um, and all that snow melted, ice melted, ran off into the rivers. And that was actually the costliest weather disaster in Kentucky's history. Um, we had several river points that um, hit record stages. I think um, along the parts of the Kentucky River, this is a picture of Beattyville that's completely underwater. Clay City was also completely underwater. It was a very big um, event for our state. And then not long after that, so this was March, early, sorry, late February, early March. In December of the same year, um, we had the tornado outbreak, which is not actually on this presentation, but, oh yeah, it is, sorry. Uh, we had the tornado outbreak. So um, if many of you all remember the big Mayfield tornado that went through Western Kentucky, you can see all the different tornado tracks that went through Central Kentucky. We got very, very, very fortunate that all of the tornadoes actually ended right before they got into eastern Kentucky. Um, so I think the closest ones we had were Monroe County and Madison County. Um, very fortunate there, but some very um, bad destruction in the western part of the state and central part of the state. Um, that then became the costliest weather disaster in Kentucky's history. So the top two costliest disasters within a year. Um, and an interesting note, um, the long tracking tornado there from Mayfield, until that tornado happened, the longest tracking tornado in the state's history was actually in eastern Kentucky, the one that went through West Liberty, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so if anybody ever tells you that tornadoes can't happen in the mountains, well, yes, they definitely can. We just got very lucky in this incident. And then everybody remembers July 2022. Um, I have some pictures here, probably bring back some, some memories. Um, and for us here at the Jackson Weather Office, we were kind of right in the epicenter of this. Some of this was in our backyards. Um, friends and friends that we have and, and neighbors were involved in this um, flooding event. See all the mud in the school there. All the bridges that were taken out. I forgot how many thousands of bridges were taken out. But not memories that we will soon forget, unfortunately. 
So looking at the flooding for the state um, and flood deaths in particular, this is from 1996 to 2021. So this is ending a year before the 2022 floods. Um, and I will say the 2022 floods were also probably one of the top three costliest weather disasters in Kentucky's history as well. So the top three within a year and a half of each other, which is very insane to think about. Um, it also just goes to prove that disasters aren't going away anytime soon. But for the flood deaths for the 25 years leading up to 2022, um, I want to take a look at some statistics here. So it wasn't just Eastern Kentucky that seen flood deaths. We've seen them all across the state. But Kentucky accounts for only 1% of the U.S. population. However, between those 25 years of 1996 and 2021, we accounted for 4% of the total flood deaths across the United States. And if you look at the um, how people passed away in the in the flood, you can see that the number one statistic here is that they were in their vehicle. They drove into a flooded roadway or um, drove into the flood waters. 65% of the deaths across the state were from driving into a flooded roadway. The reason that this stops at 2021 is because 2022 was its own beast. Um, during our flood, um, for the total year across the entire country, we had 106 deaths from flooding. 41 of those came just from Eastern Kentucky, and that number has actually gone up. Um, since I last took this screenshot, I think we're at 44 right now um, as a total count. A, a very interesting statistic, too, that changed is for years, every year that we've had flooding across the entire United States, number one statistic is people have died trying to drive through a flooded roadway. Because of the flooding in eastern Kentucky and how quickly the water came up and it was literally like a wall of water. People weren't able to escape um, in time. We actually flipped the statistic for the first time in probably U.S. history of, of known um, flood deaths that we've been keeping track of. If you look um, at the activity there, 41 people passed away while driving, but 42 people passed away while at home. So that statistic is actually higher when normally that's one of the lowest ones. Um, it just it just goes to show like how how bad that flood really was um, that the statistics for the entire U.S. will be probably forever changed when you start averaging that out. Um, I don't have the statistics in for 2023. As far as I know, thankfully, I don't think that we had any flood deaths, at least in eastern Kentucky. But we did have a major flood in western Kentucky, um, a flash flood that occurred there. And I'm not sure if they reported any deaths with that. But um, we are definitely prone to flash flooding here. We all know that. So we're going to talk more about that in the talk um, going forward. Some other events that we've had here, um, we get our fair share of snow. We just got out of a very cold uh, snap at the kind of mid part, early mid part of January. Um, pretty good snowfall amounts. I think I had about eight inches at my house total um, for the first event and another few inches after that. Um, but this was a 2016 snowstorm, if anybody remembers that. It didn't hit Letcher and Harlan counties quite as hard, um, which is not usually the norm. Usually they get a, hit a little bit harder in the mountains. But we had a swath of snow right about where we live here in Breathitt County and northeast of 18 to 24 inches. I, I will never forget that event. Um, it was actually really pretty, but, man, it was hard to get out or get around. Um, so we are definitely prone to our snow events. So some records that happened, that was our record snowfall of um, since records go back to 1981 at our office with 18.5 inches. Um, greatest calendar day snowfall, we have 15.7 inches just within one day with that event. Um, and for two day snowfalls, it ranks number three um, in our records. So pretty impactful event there. Some pictures from our office. These were our government vehicles completely covered in snow. This was actually my hill for my house. It's really hard to tell this, but that thing is like at a 30 degree slope. It is very, very, very steep. Um, and it was a very hazardous <laughs> road trying to get down that. You really couldn't get back up. So most people parked at the bottom if they didn't make it down. 2012 tornado outbreak, like I said um, previously, up until the Mayfield tornado, our longest tracking tornado went through... Um, West Liberty, and you can see it here on the map, the EF3 in eastern Kentucky, just south of Moorhead there, and then the one that went through Salyersville is just south of it. 
Um, a lot of people still remember that outbreak as well. Um, here's some pictures from West Liberty where it literally went straight through the town of West Liberty and pretty much wiped out most of the town. So keeping all these past events in mind, uh, moving forward here at the Weather Service and NOAA, um, we're committed to building a weather ready nation. That's what we call it, um, where communities are prepared for and respond appropriately to these events. The priority for the weather ready nation is to build community resilience in the face of increasing vulnerability to extreme weather, water, climate and environmental threats. Because like I said, unfortunately, these are not going away. So how do we be better prepared moving forward? So a little bit about who we are at the Weather Service. Um, I know uh, we have both Letcher and Harlan County Extension offices on here, but I have been told that we probably have people viewing in from several different counties around the area. So if you are on the Kentucky side of the mountains here, you're being served by the Jackson Kentucky Weather Service office. Uh, if you're in Lee or Wise County or any of the counties within Western Virginia or Northeast Tennessee, you're in the Morristown um, jurisdiction for the Weather Service. And these are all the counties that we serve. Obviously, you can't see all of Morristown's, but Jackson, Kentucky's office, we're located right in the middle of Breathitt County. Um, we serve 33 counties in Southeast Kentucky. And when I say we serve 33 counties, and you can see all the different jurisdictions there, these are all the counties that we forecast for. So if you get a severe thunderstorm warning, a winter weather advisory, any type of watch warning advisory, it's going to be coming from our office if you're within one of these 33 counties. And if you're within kind of the orange or shade of Morristown's area, it will be coming from that office. Um, we work 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. There's always at least two forecasters, usually on shift. So if you um, have a severe thunderstorm morning at 2 a.m., that's because we're here watching the radar at 2 a.m., making sure that we're getting that information out to you. Same thing with the forecast. Um, we're always updating the forecast. We issue at least twice a day with updates constantly 24-7. Um, so... Um, that means that we have forecasters that are doing rotating shifts. Um, so if you need to call in a report at 3 a.m. on Christmas morning, guaranteed that you're going to be able to get hold of somebody here. Um, so in addition to that, how does that kind of apply to you? How do you get our information? And there's multiple ways. Um, I'm sure that you all woke up in the morning and asked, looked in the app or asked Alexa what the weather is going to be. But um, our website is a very good tool. I have a picture of our website here. Usually if we're expecting any kind of significant weather or if we have any things to post for the public, that will be listed at the top of the page with our top weather news and briefings. If there is a briefing, there will actually be a like, it's kind of like a brown um, little rectangle in the top right. We'll have like a weather briefing and the topic. So anytime we're expecting any kind of inclement weather, you'll usually see that top right. And that will give you just kind of a very overview of what we're expecting, when we're expecting it, and how it's going to impact you. The map in the middle of the screen gives you all of Eastern Kentucky and surrounding areas, and it will list all the watches, warnings, advisories that are ongoing. Um, so you can see them in a map view. You can also click on this map. Um, it's an interactive map. So if you click on your location, so for me, if I clicked right on Jackson, it would then take me to another page that would show me just the forecast for Jackson and all the watches, warnings, advisories going on just for my single point. Um, another great resource that I know we all use is social media. So Facebook, Twitter, um, I guess now X, we're very, um, very involved in those two as well. And there's our handle there, NWS Jackson, Kentucky. Um, we're always constantly watching social media, especially when we have severe weather and we're getting reports in. These are two very great tools to give us reports as well. Um, as far as getting weather information, there's there's several good ways to do it. You can get it on our website. You can use social media, although whenever I'm talking about like um, short fuse warnings, like severe thunderstorm warnings or tornado warnings, social media is probably not the best just because a lot of things can get buried and can be old and come back and you think it's maybe a new thing and, and maybe it was issued several hours ago. Um, the next best thing would be WIA, which is on your phone. Um, cell phones in general, like if I have an app, like I have an Amazon app and a Ring app, they'll send me weather alerts through those apps. WIA is something that is a government um enabled thing on your phone. It's wireless emergency alerts. Uh, make sure that you have them turned on. It will activate anytime that we issue a severe thunderstorm warning, flash flood warning, and tornado warning. The only thing is that there's some caveats. On the WIA, 
if I issue a flash flood warning, it's not going to go off. I have to upgrade that flash flood, flood warning to a considerable or a catastrophic tag, which basically means that it's it's in, it's it's likely the flooding's coming to find you instead of you're going to find the flooding. Or if it's a catastrophic, we're talking about a flash flood emergency. That will make your phone go off. A base flash flood warning will not. Same thing with severe thunderstorm warning. A base severe thunderstorm warning will not make it go off. But if we upgrade it to hit certain thresholds, that will make it go off. So don't rely on WIA to go off for every single warning. Another issue we have, because we live in the mountains, our cell phone service is not the best. So I know that if I am going a mile down the road, there's going to be a dead spot. I might not get that WIA alert. Um, if your phone goes dead, you're not going to get the WIA alert. Meanwhile, we still have weather radio across eastern Kentucky. We're one of the best networks in the country. We have 99% coverage of no weather radio across our entire eastern Kentucky. So when you want to guarantee that you're going to get a weather alert, go to that weather radio. Um, it can plug in. It has a battery backup. You can get some that have hand cranks on them or solar powered. But if we issue a warning, I guarantee that thing's going to go off. I could save your life in the middle of the night. We had a lot of people during the flood where their phones maybe didn't go off because they were in a dead spot. Um, they didn't have um, either their phone wasn't working or they didn't have cell phone coverage. If you had a NOAA weather radio, it would have it would have gone off. So um, definitely worth the investment. It's 20 to 30 dollars, depending on what kind you get. It could be a little bit more expensive, but that thing will save your life. Um, best thing that you could do um, to get weather information. Here's another version of our map where we actually have some things going on. So just kind of a better example here where we have different warnings and advisories ongoing. So you can see maybe where you are in, let's say we're in Harlan County and what's to your west and kind of what's heading towards you, kind of a good interactive way to look at it like that. Um, for those that are located in the Morristown's area, um, I gave you our website here is weather.gov slash Jackson, Kentucky. If you're in Morristown's area, do the same thing, dot weather.gov just slash Morristown will take you there. Um, or you can go to our national map, which is just simply weather.gov. Um, if I clicked on Eastern Kentucky on this map, it would take me to the site we just saw. If I clicked um, in Western Virginia or um, Northeast Tennessee, it would take me to Morristown's. But you can see it a national view on this map, just weather.gov. It shows you all the weather service offices, all the watch warnings advisories going on across the entire country. Um, you can click on that specific location where you see maybe the blizzard warning ongoing and, and see what's happening in that area. Um, or you can click on the warning itself below and, and see where, where all the blizzard warnings are across the state or across the country. So different ways you can visualize the information. So I think there's a lot of confusion sometimes whenever we are issuing watches, warnings, advisories. There's all these different products that we're issuing. What exactly is the difference between some of these things? And so it's probably a good idea to start a lot of our talks with how the information starts and how it's going to end up. So usually um, ahead of time, anywhere between 24 hours to three or four days ahead of time, even up to seven days, um, the Storm Prediction Center, which is in Norman, Oklahoma, will start looking at weather patterns across the U.S. as well as the local forecast offices. And they will decide, OK, well, this particular area of the country has the ingredients in the coming days to potentially have a, a potential for severe weather or potential for tornado production. Um, and they will issue an outlook. And that outlook can usually span across several states. It could be a whole region. Um, but it's basically saying that this is what we have decided, that this area has the best chance of seeing severe weather in the coming days, the coming hours. Um, it could pose a threat to life and property. And this is a good time to go ahead and prepare a plan of action. Now, as we get closer to time, usually within a few hours, um, we will work with the local offices and Storm Prediction Center, and we will narrow that down and we will issue what we call a watch. So if we think that the outlook area... Um, if someplace within that outlook area has the ingredients, the ingredients are coming together and that we might end up with severe weather or a tornado threat, then we will issue a watch. A watch is usually going to be either part of a state or part of a couple of states. Um, and it, that's where the risk of severe weather is most likely to occur. That's where most of the ingredients are. Um, that's the point you need to start having a plan of action. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, once we've issued a watch, it could go one or three ways, really. Um, just because we issue a watch does not always mean that we're going to upgrade it to a warning. In some cases, 
we've had a watch out, but maybe the ingredients aren't coming together in a certain part of that watch. We might just let that go completely. And that's included even in winter weather. Uh, maybe we've had a winter weather watch out or a flood watch out, but maybe the ingredients aren't coming together like they were supposed to, then we might drop it. That doesn't mean that the watch wasn't warranted. It just means that lucky for you, it didn't come to fruition. More than likely though, uh, it probably will. If we have a watch out, we have at least a 50% chance or 50% confidence that we will have something. So if we do issue um, from there, it will either be a warning or an advisory. And so the difference between an advisory and a warning, uh, I think a lot of people get these confused as well. A warning means that it poses threat to life and property. That means it's going to cause dangerous conditions. It's going to cause um, damage to your property. Um, you're putting yourself at risk by being in that type of weather. So that could be a severe thunderstorm. That could be a flood event. That could be um, a winter weather event. Advisory is a little bit less. It doesn't mean that you couldn't see impacts. It just means that it's probably not going to be a life-threatening situation. So it could be more of an inconvenience. So for instance, in winter weather terms, um, if we're expecting four inches of snow um, in an event, we're probably going to be issuing a warning. But if we're expecting less than that, where it's maybe not going to be as impactful, but maybe in more of an inconvenience on the roads, it could be a little bit more dangerous. We're probably going to be issuing an advisory. Um, the same thing goes for severe weather as well. So just because we have a watch out doesn't mean it's always going to go straight to a warning. Um, just kind of keep that in mind. You could either have nothing, you could have a warning, or you might be a little bit less in that advisory. So a cool way to visualize this, to kind of remember it a little bit better, um, is the cupcake theory and also the taco watch and taco warning. I like these. They're a little bit more visually um, helpful in trying to remember how this works. So an outlook is, hey, I'm thinking about making a cupcake. It may happen. I'm thinking about it. I'm going to I'm going to maybe make it make it come to fruition. So the watch means, OK, I've decided I think I want to make the cupcake. All the ingredients are here. I've set them out. Um, that's my watch phase. The warning means that all the ingredients have come together. The cupcake has been made. Your severe weather is ongoing. It's happening. You need to take action. In other words, you need to eat the cupcake. But um, that is that is meaning that it is occurring. You have your cupcake. Um, that is your cupcake warning. Same thing with the taco. When you got a taco watch, you have all your ingredients there. Maybe they haven't all come together yet, but once they come together to make that taco, now you're in the warning. Um, so hopefully that's a little bit of a cool way to remember that. Um, I know there's a lot of words on this slide, but it really goes back to what we were just discussing before. Um, we want to make sure that you're safe in severe weather, and that's going to be a lot of what this talk is about. Um, so any any type of um, weather that we're expecting, always make sure you're prepared and be aware. Have multiple ways of getting um, weather information. Know, understand the weather forecast. Prepare that disaster kit for all seasons. I know we're in winter right now. As we head into the next couple of months, maybe start thinking about preparing your disaster kit for um, severe weather season. And then going back to these color coded things, if you remember when we were talking about the outlook, that was that green color. Identify a shelter location before the storm. So if if we've issued an outlook, if SPCs issue an outlook, you've seen it. Um, we've probably started um, advertising it on our on our website. I'm sure the media started advertising it. Um, we've sent briefings out. Um, so you're probably hearing it from multiple sources. But once we have an outlook out, that's a good time to go ahead and start identifying where your shelters are before the storm so that you know where you can take a safe, um, where you can get to a safe place. Once we've issued the watch, at that point, start planning your day around the weather. So, for instance, if you were planning on being outside for the day, maybe working on the farm, maybe you're going to be at a ball game, maybe you're going to be at someone else's house and maybe they don't have a good shelter. Maybe you should start changing your plans so that you have a way to get to shelter or if you keep your plans that you know where to go very quickly in order to get to shelter in case the storm does pop up and we issue a warning. Because as soon as I issue that warning, which is the red, I need you to take appropriate action immediately. It doesn't mean that you can wait 10 minutes. It means that, hey, the cupcake's here. Hey, the tornado's here. Hey, the severe thunderstorm is here. You need to take action immediately. So all of the preceding um, steps that we just went through need to already be completed before we get to that point. So let's talk about some weather safety here. Well, first of all, what is a severe thunderstorm? Whenever I keep saying severe thunderstorm, what exactly does that mean? That means that the thunderstorm has hail that's at least one inch or greater. 
Um, and we also refer to that as quarter size because a quarter is one inch. Um, winds that are 58 miles per hour or more. I want to caveat on this one. 58 miles per hour is a very weird number. I realize that. Um, it's actually because it was converted from, um, from how was that? I think it was like metric system. Um, so usually in our warnings, it's actually, we just put 60 miles per hour in there. But that's the point at which winds actually start causing things to, to be damaged. So you will start getting limbs that are at least two inches falling down, trees coming down, roofings being peeled. We pick that number because that's the threshold of damage occurring. So if you have winds that are just like flopping the trees, but like they're not falling down. You just see them swaying really hard. If it's not causing some big limbs or some trees to fall down, it's probably not quite to severe threshold yet. Obviously, if there's a tornado, that is also making that storm severe. Um, we will always have a severe thunderstorm warning out. Um, if there's a tornado, we will also additionally probably have a tornado warning out separately. So you might see a tornado warning for tornado but you may also see a severe thunderstorm warning because we may still have the ability to get hail and winds within the rest of the storm while the tornado warning itself is going to be a little bit smaller just for the tornado. Um, and we'll talk more about hail here in a bit, um, but just keep in mind, we don't issue severe thunderstorm warnings for heavy rain or for lightning. If we're issuing anything for heavy rain, it's going to be a flood product um, and lightning. We're going to talk more about in a minute as to why we do not issue for lightning. So take severe thunderstorm warning seriously. Um, I know we're all worried about tornadoes and the winds that tornadoes can do, but really straight line winds and, and thunderstorms can be just as destructive as a tornado, sometimes even more destructive. Um, we have a lot of haulers. Um, winds can easily be channeled up the haulers and strengthen. This is not um, in Eastern Kentucky. This is actually in Iowa. Um, it was a very strong um, wind system that moved through on the front edge of a what we call a squall line or derecho. They have winds in excess of 80 to 90 miles per hour. Um, if I issue something with 80 miles per hour, it will make your WIA go off. Um, that is stronger than an EF0 tornado. Unfortunately, this mobile home and this picture of the family that lived there did not survive. Um, if you can tell though, one key thing that you know that it's a straight line wind is that all of the debris and all the damage and even the trees are all going one direction. Um, so that's an easy way to tell if you had a straight line wind. Is everything in all different directions or is it all heading one way? Um, so treat severe thunderstorm warning seriously, especially because we put in there the expected winds. So if you see anything above a 60 mile per hour wind, expect that you're going to see some kind of damage around your area. Um, as far as tornadoes, whenever we get a tornado warning and a, and a confirmed tornado, we didn't go out into that tornado and stick up an anemometer to figure out what the winds were. Um, what we usually end up doing is we have a warning out, hopefully, um, and let's say that we've had damage, we'll get reported back to our office, usually by the emergency management of the county, and we'll come out and we'll do a um, survey of the tornado. And how we determine the, the wind speed is by looking at the damage itself. Um, we will use damage indicators. Um, quality of the construction is huge. Um, quality of things like the trees. Um, so was it a very large hardwood that was healthy that got that got um, uprooted or did it get snapped or was it a um, small tree? Was it a rotted tree? Different things like that. Um, was the house a mobile home? Was it anchored down well? If it was a stick built house, how was the construction of that house? Um, we go through a lot of different things and we will comb the entire width and length of that tornado path um, for all trees, buildings, anything that we can use for damage indicators. And we will get a ranking of the wind using that and the software that we have that we use. Um, but kind of keep in mind these thresholds here. EF0 is a 65 to 85 mile per hour wind. So that picture you just saw where the mobile home got um, pretty much blown away, um, they were getting closer to maybe EF1 um, tornado, even though it was a straight line wind. Um, the West Liberty tornado that we had uh, was the very top end of EF3. Some argue that it was actually a low end EF4. Um, the what? Or sorry, the Mayfield tornado was at probably the top end of the EF4 um, as it went through. So um, once we get into like the EF3 and higher, 
Um, when I say the quality of construction is considered, I'm also not a structural engineer. I'm a meteorologist. So when we start getting into some of these higher end events, we will actually bring in teams um, with structural engineers to help us to decide the strength of the winds that cause um, the damage to the to the buildings and to the infrastructure. And I will say too, like once we get the wind, then we can give it the rating. So this is a webcam, or sorry, not a webcam, a um, security camera from a house in West Liberty um, during the 2020, sorry, the 2012 tornado. Um, we can see the hail starting to fall just before the tornado hits. This house will be hit by the tornado, though I don't know the extent of the damage once it's over with. But this is why we never want to be outside during a tornado if, if we can help it. Um, I think a lot of people think that the most dangerous part of a tornado is the tornado itself, that it's going to suck you up, that it's going to throw you. And really the most dangerous part of a tornado is the debris. So as we're watching this film here, you can see everything that's being thrown around. There goes the grill, the trees are down, the shed has been knocked off its foundation. Then you see these trees rotate. Um, so again, if it was a straight line wind, everything would be going the same direction. But as you can see here, everything's swirling around. And I don't think I want to be stuck out in the middle of that. If you look up in the top right of your screen in just a second here, you can actually see the tornado. Um, it's right there. So this is why we never want you to be part of the debris. The best way to survive a tornado is to be out of the debris. Anything that tornado touch that is flying through the air is considered debris. I've seen some really weird things happen with debris too. I've seen two by fours be impaled through metal. I've seen blades of grass be impaled through wood. Wind can do some pretty crazy things, so never underestimate the power of it. So if there is a tornado warning, where is the best place to go? Well, best place above anything is going to be underground. All that debris that you saw is flying, which means it's flying above ground. If you can get a shelter underground, that's the best place. Um, if you have a storm shelter or if you have a basement, um, that's the number one place to go. If you do not have a basement, the next best place is the lowest um lowest level of your house and an interior room, which basically means that none of the walls of that room are going to touch the outside of your house. You want as many walls between you and the outside of the house as possible. I know a lot of people say, well, the best place for me to go is my bathroom. Well, if your bathroom has a window, it's not necessarily the best place to go. It might end up being a hallway or a closet. I also want you to pick the smallest room. If you have multiple interior rooms, let's say you have a bathroom, a hallway and a closet, pick the smallest one. And the way I, I visualize this to kids, and this picture is a good example, imagine that your house is a box or imagine that the room that you're in is a box and we're going to take that roof off the box. We're going to take the lid off. The smaller your box is, the less things can fit in it. So if you're in a big open room, even though it's an interior room, think of all the things that could fit inside of that room and all the things that could be swirled around and thrown around that room if the roof was gone, if the, if the lid was off versus if you were in a closet and you have four walls around you that are very, you're in a very small space, it's a lot harder for things to get inside of that box. Um, so pick the smallest interior room that you have. Um, do not go on any top floors, no exterior um, rooms with windows. Do not shelter next to a window. Um, outside is not good. And we'll talk about some um, caveats to that here in just a second. This was uh, during the 2020, sorry, 2012 tornado again. Um, this was a split level house. It took me a while to figure that out. But the basement is kind of half exposed there at the bottom. But if they were on that top floor, there's no way they would have survived that tornado. It completely wiped the slate clean. So in this case, basement would have been the best bet. Now, here's the caveat. If you live in a mobile home. There were 24 fatalities in 2012 with that outbreak. 67% of those were mobile homes. Um, I went out with Louisville's office and I surveyed a lot of the tornadoes in central Kentucky. And we saw a lot of mobile homes that had been hit by the tornadoes. Every single person survived. And why did they survive? Because they got out. They did not stay in that mobile home. I don't care how well your mobile home is anchored down. I don't care if it's concreted all the way around. Um, they are not meant to withstand the strength of most tornadic winds, even straight line winds like we saw in that one picture. Um, they are made at a factory. They have to hit certain specifications for winds. Unfortunately, they're just not strong enough. So most of the frames look like just like this picture here. They were twisted. They were thrown off the foundation. They were thrown off of their uh, where they were tied down. 
and they were in pieces. Um, a lot of people made a very last minute decision to get out. Either they went to a neighbor's house or they had enough warning time in that situation. That they were able to get out of the path of the tornado, but everyone survived simply because they were not in that mobile home. Mobile homes are basically debris um, and you do not want to be in that debris. So let's say that you are in your mobile home um, and we issue a tornado warning and you just don't have time to get out. You don't have time to find another person's house to make ultimate alternate arrangements or you don't have time to drive away from the path, I do not want you to stay in that mobile home. The best thing you can do is to get out, get outside. I know that sounds contradictory, but find the lowest lying area on your property. We're fortunate here in Eastern Kentucky that we at least have a lot of hills and haulers and, and low lying areas and creeks. So get into the lowest lying area, even if that's like maybe a culvert that runs through your property, if you have a ditch line that you can get into. And then cover your head, lay flat, cover your head, because the hope is that most of that debris will then fly over top of you. Um, because I'd rather it fly over top of you than you be part of that twisted metal right there. Um, another thing I tell a lot of the kids, too, and I will tell the adults, this might sound silly, but helmets are huge. Helmets, the whole point of a helmet is to protect your head um, from trauma. So I don't care if it's a bike helmet, a firefighter helmet, a sporting helmet. If you have a helmet or if you don't have a helmet, I actually went out and bought a helmet, um, even though I have no reason for one other than for um, if I'm in a tornado, especially if you live in a mobile home and you're going to have to take shelter outside, stick a helmet on. Because if you got a 150 mile per hour wind coming at you and you're holding a pillow over your head or a mattress, I'm pretty sure that's no match for 150 mile per hour winds. Um, if a two by four hit me in the head, I'm probably not going to make it. If a two by four hit me in the head with a helmet on, I stand a chance. Um, so definitely get a helmet if you can. Here's some other mobile home pictures here as well. Now, if you're in a vehicle, um, it does get a little bit of a sticky situation. I think a lot of people have heard the rumor, oh, get into an overpass or an underpass, sorry. Um, get underneath an overpass. It's actually not the best idea. And there's a picture here. It's an older picture, but kind of hard to see it. There's a bunch of people crowding under the overpass. Um, unfortunately, that actually funnels the winds when it goes through the um, underpass part. So you're actually increasing the winds. You're also probably channeling that debris towards you um, because it's wanting to go through the tunnel. Um, your parked car then blocks traffic. It puts others at risk. I know we're in a pretty rural area. There's not as many overpasses, but we still have some. So even if you see that and you think that's the best place to go, it may not be. Again, I'm going to tell you to do exactly what you would do in a mobile home is to get out of your car. Your car is basically just flying debris if a tornado hits it. Get out of your car, get into the ditch, get into the lowest lying area and cover your head just like you would if you were in a mobile home. Is it foolproof? No. Is it better than being in the car or in the mobile home? Definitely. Um, so those would be my two recommendations there. Now, lightning. Um, I told you earlier, we do not issue severe thunderstorm warnings on lightning. Lightning is an electrical charge. And if you can see in this background picture here, there's lightning going all the way across the sky. It's almost impossible to tell exactly where lightning is going to strike next. Um, there's a lot of studies being done. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, we're getting better, but every single thunderstorm has lightning in it. That's the reason it's called a thunderstorm. So we can't issue a lightning warning or a thunderstorm warning for every single thunderstorm. So instead, I'm just going to teach you that lightning is very dangerous. One of the reasons, it's 50,000 degrees. That's hotter than the surface of the sun. So take lightning seriously. Um, as we say, when thunder roars, goes indoor, go indoors. So some things about lightning. It often strikes outside of the heavy rain. Um, it may occur as far as 10 miles away from where the rain is falling. So because of that, a lot of people will wait till the storm passes and then they'll go back outside to do what they were doing. But as long as you can still hear thunder, you're still close enough to be struck by lightning. So more than 50% of lightning does occur after the storm passed. So um, some of the bigger, um, or I guess some of the most common um, locations would be people on golf courses, people um, on lakes and swimming pools, and people out on farms and fields. Um, if you have to go back outside after the storm has passed, wait till you do not hear any thunder and then go back outside because at that point you should be far enough away from the storm. Um, if you're close enough to hear thunder, um, that means you need to seek shelter. Um, seek an indoor shelter, a building with four walls, preferably electricity and plumbing as well, because if it were to hit the house or the building that you're in, it will go through the electricity and the plumbing and be grounded. All lightning needs to be grounded. It needs to hit the ground. 
Um, and so if you're in an open building that has maybe like walls that are open, so like a pavilion or a like dugout, something like that, the lightning can still come inside. You do not want to do that. If it were to hit your house using a telephone that's wired in, I think it's funny when you tell kids this, they have no idea what a wired tel telephone looks like. Um, using your cell phone is okay, but if the phone is connected to the wall, either being charged through the electrical system or it's an old school landline phone, um, do not use it because if the electricity goes through your um, electrical system, or sorry, if the lightning goes through your electrical system, it's going to affect that as well. Um, it will also go through your plumbing. So if you take a bath or a shower, there's the risk that if your house got struck by lightning, it's going to electrify your water as well. That's why we tell people in lakes and in, and in pools to get out because it will electrify the entire water source. Um, if you're stuck outside, get in your vehicle. That's the best chance. I know there's this rumor and that a lot of people have heard that it's the rubber tires that save you and lightning. That is not true. That is a complete false myth. Um, what really saves you in your car is the fact that your car is made out of a metal cage. So if lightning were to strike your vehicle, it's probably going to strike the metal of your vehicle. It's going to go around the metal cage through the tires and back into the ground again. So as long as you are on the inside of that metal cage, you should be okay. That doesn't mean that I want to be like touching the outside of my car. Um, but in knowing cars these days with all the electrical systems they have, if your car were to get struck by lightning, it's probably, it's probably done for as far as driving. But as long as you're on the inside of that vehicle, hopefully you should be, um, in a lot better position than you, if you were outside. Um, another, as we talked about earlier, big, um, consideration around here is the flooding. Um, it's the number one weather killer in the United States. It's certainly the number one weather killer in Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky. Um, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time on this just because it is so impactful. Like I said before, many people dry, sorry, many people die trying to cross a flooded roadway. Um, so we say when flooded, turn around, don't drown. And water may be over a road you know very well, but the problem is if you can't see the road underneath the water, you don't know what the condition of that road is. Um, this one's pretty self-explanatory. There's enough water over the road that I wouldn't try to risk it, especially because I can tell in this picture alone that it's flowing pretty strongly. Um, you don't know if that road's still there or not. Um, there's some more pictures here. This is after some of the flooding that we had. If I try to cross that road on the left, um, if you can tell there, the pavement has been completely washed out. I had another picture at one point where um, maybe the culvert on the side of the road was washed out. So even though you could see part of your lane, what you didn't know is that the, the side of the road was completely gone. So anytime you have water over a road, you can't see the road underneath it. Whatever you do, do not try to cross that flooded roadway. Because for all you know, there's nothing to support you underneath. It only takes, and I think I have it on here somewhere. Um, it only takes six inches of flowing water to knock you off your feet as a as a person. It only takes 12 inches of water to knock a vehicle off of its traction and cause it to become buoyant. And I'm talking anything from like a small sedan to like a large pickup truck. Once we start getting into like tractor trailers, it takes a few more inches, but only like up to 18. So if it only takes 12 to 18 inches to lift a tractor trailer up and cause it to become buoyant, Somebody driving the car should never try to cross the flooded roadway because it does not take much to get that traction lost. And then suddenly you're in the flooded, um, you're in the flood itself. And then you're going to have to call, um, hopefully, if you can get out or if you can call for help. And not only that, then you're also putting other people at risk trying to rescue you. I know it's really difficult around here at night, um, especially in the mountains, because you go around a turn and you just don't know what you're running into. And that's another reason you need to be weather aware. If we've got flash flood warnings out or we're expecting um, high water and we've had a lot of rain, take a little bit more time to get to your destination. Um, make sure that you're you're not going into um, flooded areas that you know are prone without taking extra caution before you go into them to kind of see um so maybe instead of going like 80 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, go a little bit slower, um, put on those high headlights. But just make sure that if you can avoid the flooded roadway to do so. So before a flood, stay informed. Again, making sure you have access to weather information. Determine whether you're in a flood likely area. So is your home um, in a floodplain? Is your school work? Um, do you know the access out? Um, is there multiple ways to get out? What roads typically flood first? Um, 
create a communications plan. A communications plan is huge. And something I learned during the Eastern Kentucky floods, whenever you create a communications plan, sometimes the best idea is to have one person that's kind of like the go-to. So everybody reports to that one person and they're able to keep track of everybody. Sometimes it's better if that person is not in your same location. So for instance, all of our communications went out in Eastern Kentucky and it was really hard for people to get hold of one another. If you were able to get hold of one person that was maybe several counties away from where the flooding happened, they can keep better track of who they were able to, to get hold of and who they weren't versus somebody that's in the disaster themselves. Um, so just kind of an idea for that. Emergency kit again. There's some really good ideas on ready.gov, I do believe, that you can look up. Um, you can even just Google emergency kit. It's going to be different for every person. Um, but you can do it for flooding, you can do it for winter, you can do it for severe weather. Um, if you um, are in an area that might tend to get flooded, prepare for possible evacuation. Go ahead and pack. The best thing that could happen is you don't have to evacuate. But in case you do, you'll be ready. Um, if you have time to charge your electronics, especially like your phone um, or a laptop, in case you need to take it with you. And be proactive. Leave before the flooding starts. If they come and they say, hey, like we're going to evacuate you do it. I'd rather you be evacuated and nothing happened to your house than be in a situation where two hours later you're being basically taken to the top of your roof and, and having to hope that you get rescued. During a flood, stay informed. Again, make sure you have weather information that you're able to get. Get to higher ground. If you have nothing else that you can do, get to higher ground. And that means to get on a roof, get on a hillside. Um, do not try to go through that flooded roadway. If that's your only escape route driving wise, don't do it. Get to higher ground. Um, follow those evacuation orders, like I said. If you have time before you evacuate, disconnect utilities and appliances. That's simply because the less things that you can put into the floodwaters as far as electricity, maybe you could save a few things. Um, so if the floodwaters only get up like about a foot and you've unplugged um, some of the things that are higher than that, like your TV or computers, those might be safe afterwards. Whereas if they're plugged in, they're going to be gone. Um, avoid those floodwaters, though. It's never safe to drive or walk through them because you do not know what's in the floodwaters. And here's the things I said earlier about how much water it takes um, to lift up a vehicle or yourself. And then after a flood, again, make sure that you know um, what's going on in in the news and the in the weather world. Um, anything from like the safety of your drinking water to what roads are still closed and what areas are affected. Don't get in those floodwaters. You do not know what's inside of those floodwaters. If, if you're trying to rescue somebody, that's one thing. But if you can stay, if you can help it, don't get inside those waters because you could have people, um, you could have debris in there. You could have ele electrical things in there. You could have dead animals in there. You could have chemicals in there. There's a lot of bad things that could be in there. Avoid those disasters areas. If you're not part of the disaster, don't go there because you're basically just making a hindrance to the people that are trying to do emergency operations. Heed the road closures. If you are on the other side of the road closure and you need to get home, then call your um, police, call your your um, EM and see if you can get somebody to take you to your house rather than you trying to get through the floodwaters yourself um, and wait for that all clear before returning. And then again, that communications plan, contact your family, contact that communications, um, a lot of communication person to make sure that they know that you're safe and they can account for everyone. Okay, now let's change some gears real quick here to winter safety. Um, I know that we're kind of dead in the middle of winter right now, and I think all of us wish that it was gone. But um, if, if you haven't already prepared a little bit with the last big snap that we had, um, some ideas that you can prepare your car, first aid kit, jumper cable, spare tire, blankets, just because you never know where you might get stranded um, in a winter event. Um, so some of these are some good ideas for your car. Um, we also have a good website here if you want to write that down. It's weather.gov slash safety slash winter during. And it gives you some really good tips for your house, um, for traveling, um, just for winter in general. So I highly recommend that website. And I think we also tend to use the word wind chill a lot. Um, in the summertime, we'll use um, the heat, but in the wintertime, you'll hear wind chill. Um, and what does wind chill actually mean? Well, if I were standing outside and there was no wind, how would the temperature affect me versus if there is wind? And that's the wind chill. So what wind does is it takes the heat from your body and it tries to basically blow it away. So if 
there's no wind under calm conditions the body radiates heat that creates a layer of warmth between our skin and our clothes and the cold surroundings but if it has windy conditions then i'm taking that heat and i'm moving it away away from my body air breaks up the insulating layer and it speeds up the heat loss and so then it feels closer instead of 98.6 degrees my body is now at 95 degrees so when we say wind chill, it has a lot to do with how much wind is in the air and how much heat it's pulling away from your body. So it might say that it's 10 degrees outside, but the wind chill makes it feel like negative 20. Well, that's what your body temperature um, is going to be feeling. And the colder it is, the more likely you are for things like hypothermia. Um, the quicker your body temperature is going to drop. How do we dress for cold weather? Well, when it's chilly outside, we're all kind of used to this. One to two layers, long layers, warm shoes, um, keep out the wind, like a windproof jacket's great. Once we get cold, we need to bundle up a little bit more. So one to two layers on the pants, two to three layers on the upper body. Try to keep out the wind and the snow, so waterproof or windproof. Boots, um, a warm hat, we lose most of our uh, most of our body heat comes out of our hands, our feet, and our head. Um, so put a hat on. Now once we get to the extreme cold, make sure that you're adding extra layers. The less exposure of skin, the better, because we do not want to lose that heat away from our bodies like we just talked about in the um, in the wind chill. And then if you start seeing people with some of these signs or you yourself start to experience this, this is when you need to start getting medical attention. So if you're outside, it's really cold, you start getting confused, you start shivering, you maybe have difficult speaking or you see someone having these issues. Um, they're getting sleepy, stiff muscles. That's a sign of hypothermia. Get them inside warm as quick as possible and call for medical attention at that point. The same thing goes for heat, too. Um, we start talking about um, heat in the summertime. Um, not only is it just the heat, but also how does it feel? How does it feel on your skin? Um, heat exhaustion is a real thing. So um, if you're outside, you start to get dizzy, really thirsty, you get heavy sweating, nausea, weakness, you're probably suffering from heat exhaustion. So you need to move to a cooler area quickly, loosen the clothing around you, get cold water inside of you and seek medical help if, if you're not getting better. And then the heat stroke is once you start getting a little bit above that, you start getting confused, dizzy, um, you start to lose consciousness. That's a 911 at that point. Um, get them into a colder area. Do all the same things as before, but make sure you're calling 911 to get the medical help because a heat stroke can cause death or permanent disability if you do not get immediate emer emergency care. So take it seriously, especially if we issue like something like a heat advisory. Um, take those into consideration to make plans ahead of time that you have ways to get. If you're going to be outside all day, that you have cold water. You have a place you can go to cool down. Um you, you have people available that could call 911. Have, have multiple ways of, of making sure that you're safe in those conditions. Okay, so we talked a lot about weather, um, hazards, how to stay safe. We also need your all's help to report some of this weather. So let's say we had a severe storm that went through, and yes, you stayed safe because you took shelter, um, but it doesn't really help um, unless you also report some of that weather so that we know, okay, did, did, did we actually have severe weather at your location? Did we not? You all are crucial <laughs> for helping us um, get information um, so that we give the better information to you and you give information to us. It's um, That way we do a better job in the long run as well. So whenever we ask for information, there's kind of five things that we ask for. Um, it's very simple. Who you are, um, say, okay, I am Jeremy Williams. Um, I am the um, extension agent in Harlan County, or I'm a trained spotter. After this class, you can say, hey, I'm a trained spotter. I'm with law enforcement, whatever it is. And then what you're seeing or what happened. That could be that, hey, I had a tree down in my front yard. Hey, I have shingles off my roof. Hey, I have four inches of snow. Tell us what happened. The next one is where. I have a lot of stars next to that one. I have a, have a soft point, <laughs> a soft point on this. Um, where is very crucial. Like, for instance, if I had a tree down in Harlan, but my warning ended maybe like within a half a mile of the city boundary of Harlan, um, maybe the tree actually fell on the outside of the warning. 
Um, whenever we get a storm report, we actually submit it. Um, it goes into record. It goes um, out to the public and to the media and to, to emergency management. Um, so the most specific point you can give me, the better. So, for instance, if a tree fell down, if you can give me the name of the street that it fell down on, an address, I don't expect you to have the latitude and longitude, but if you do, that's great. If you have a um, an intersection, um, any type of way that you can help us on Google Maps to find that point that that damage happened. Um, when did it happen? So what time did you see the tree go down? What time did you observe the snowfall? The duration is very helpful too. Now, also, if it's in the past, that's okay. So for instance, if you came home and the storm happened maybe a few hours ago and you noticed that there was a tree down along your drive, I still want you to report it because we can go back on our radar and look to see when the highest winds went through and kind of figure out probably when that tree or that damage would have occurred. Um, so even if you have damage and you didn't know when it occurred, it still is helpful to go ahead and call it into the weather service and we can go back and try to figure that out. Um, be as descriptive as you can. That's the thing. Be as descriptive. But number one, make sure you're in a safe spot before you make that call, before you make that report, um, because we do not want to put you in harm's way if you're trying to get us information. I have a website down here. And Jeremy, I'm just going to ask you real quick. Can you all still see my screen? Because it looked like my um, screen on your and changed a little bit. Looks, looks good to me. Okay, looks good. good. Um, so I have a website down here. I want you all to write that down. Um, it's going to be a little bit different from Morristown, um, but I think you can probably um, get to it on their weather.gov slash Morristown site. Um, this website will actually um, give you all the different ways that you can report um, weather information to the weather service. And I'm going to see if it will pop up here. Um, can you all see this or no? Do you see a website? Do you see a website, Jeremy? Yes, it's popped up. Yes. Okay, good. Perfect. Okay. So that link I just gave you um, will tell you all the different ways. You can submit an online report, Facebook, Twitter, um, how, how to get to our Facebook and our Twitter page. A lot of people use social media. We love social media because pictures say a thousand words. Um, the more pictures you can give us, the better. Um, there's an email option. There's also a mobile app called Mping. I don't really recommend it in Eastern Kentucky because it's a little bit too vague sometimes. But all of these other options are great. Um, so... If you have a chance, um, I think this is being recorded. Uh, if you haven't written this down, go back and make sure you write that down in case you want to submit a report to the Weather Service. Because the more information we have on what occurred at your location, the better decisions we can make moving forward. Okay, um, doing weird things here on my screen. Um, so, okay, are you still seeing my screen, Jeremy? Your screen is currently not up. I can see you okay. on the screen. Got it. I'll fix that. Okay. And we're back. <laughs> we good now? Yes. Screen's up. Okay. Awesome. So when we're reporting hail, I mentioned this at the very beginning. I would talk a little bit more about this. A lot of people try to report hail as marble size. Please try to avoid that because marbles can be all sizes. Um, when we're reporting hail, we typically use common objects that we know the size of. So we'll usually start off with coins like a dime, penny, nickel, quarter. Again, quarter is one inch, so that now is severe. We choose one inch for the severe hail criteria because that's the point at which hail starts causing damage. Um, you will start getting dings on your car, dings on your roof, dings on your siding, anything smaller than that. I don't care if you have like a foot of nickel-sized hail. It's probably not going to actually cause any damage. Um, once you get to quarter-sized hail, then you start receiving damage. And then after we've gone through the the coins we're start gonna, we're going to start using things like sporting equipment balls so ping pong ball golf ball um all the way up to softball the largest hailstone ever recorded in the u.s was actually the size of a volleyball if you can imagine and it was probably coming down at at least 100 miles an hour so not not a safe place also, too, if you can use like on your pictures of reference for like social media, if you can see here, they actually put the coin on the the surface as they took the picture. So we can kind of see as a reference how big it was. Always report the biggest hailstone. So if you have a hundred 
pea size hailstones, but you have one hailstone in there that's a quarter size, you now have a severe storm. Um, so I want you to report the biggest hailstone using a picture with a um, reference point is very helpful so we can see the size. Um, even if it's not as big of a quarter, like this one picture, it's not as big of a quarter, but at least we can compare the size to the quarter. Um, I also love it when people call and report hail, even if it's not severe, because from us looking at the radar perspective, it's really hard for us to tell the difference maybe between a nickel size hail and a quarter size hail, um, especially when we're looking really far out in the distance. So if you can send in a report of just what type of hail you're receiving, that's actually very, very helpful for us. Okay, and with that, that is all I have. Um, I, I do like this little quote at the end here. We could all take lesson from weather. It pays no attention to criticism. Um, that part being true, uh, we will continue to see severe weather um, forever and ever and ever in Eastern Kentucky. I just hope that this helped you prepare a little bit more for it um, and has have different ways for you to get information. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Jeremy. Jay Marie, thank you so much. Uh, uh, excellent program. Uh, it's really good. Uh, I think that uh, provides a great synopsis for things and uh, uh, excellent job as always. Shad, do you have any questions or comments? I just wanted to brag. That's probably one of the better speakers that we've had. So uh, you obviously knew what you were talking about and it was very useful. Thank you. Thanks, Shad. I couldn't get words out sometimes. <laughs> But hopefully you got the idea. But Jay Marie, great stuff. Thank you so much for uh, joining this this evening and uh, really good stuff. And uh, uh, we we may have you back again at some point. And uh, but we thank you for uh, taking time out of your schedule uh, in the evening and uh, and joining us. So, uh, but um, without further ado, I think we've got uh, another Zoom uh, Mount Zoom tomorrow night. Uh, Shad, is it on uh, frost seeding? Pasture frost field? seeding with uh, Chris Toich from the University of Kentucky. All right, good deal. So we'll have another mountain soon tomorrow evening. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, some folks can come out and join us then. But uh, Jay Marie, once again, thank you. And uh, everybody have a uh, great evening and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you.